What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be taking a look at Citizen Sleeper. For the life of me, I can't really tell you what this game's about. It's got a really, really cool art style and it popped on into my recommended list, actually. And it doesn't have that many reviews and yet the art style seems slick and clean and it's got itself tagged as being an RPG. From what I can derive from just general conversations about the game through like Steam and other places that I've Googled, it seems to be a game that's drawing inspiration from like Tharsis, I guess? And honestly, I always found Tharsis to be a really, really compelling game for all of its flaws. And so the idea of a game like Tharsis with a bit slicker of an art style and kind of a focused narrative actually seemed really, really interesting to me. And so anyways, this is a game that takes place on a space station and we're going to be using dice rolls and things of that nature in order to keep the place up and running but more than that I can't really tell you because like the game is sort of nondescript in the way that it describes itself and so anyways let's dive on in if after watching this you wanted to get the game for yourself I've got a link for you down below in the description and then on top of that you can also take a look down there for discord and twitch links just in case you wanted to hang out with me even even more even more z's but we've got about 25 35 minutes so let's go ahead and play the game shall we Alright, so we can choose our character class. We have the Operator. Man, look at that art style though, dude. Very like Aeon Flux influenced. I don't know, that's the vibe that I get from it anyways. Uh, an Operator works with drones and high precision remote machines to perform complex tasks from a distance. Sleepers are assigned to Operator when they are cerebral and precise. Okay, so we've got interfacing skill. We don't have a lot of endurance. It looks like we don't have a lot of intuition. We're not good at engaging. It looks like basically you get kind of like a bonus, a malice, and then everything else stays even. What does this guy do? The extractor. Extractors work on resource ex Okay, I guess that makes sense. The nomenclature suddenly has become clear. Sleepers assigned to extractor work are confident, self-sufficient, and have a high level of endurance. Okay, so they have low intuition but they have high endurance, but he's also got a sweet gun right there with a Nalgene canister attached to it. So, like, maybe we always stay hydrated. Okay. So we just pick between these two. There's just those two. Oh, no, there's one over to the left, too. Okay. The Machinist. Uh, you repair and modify automated system used in industrial resource extraction. Sleepers assigned to Machinist work are diligent, careful, and structured people. Okay, I think I'm going to go with the drone engineer just because I tend to favor drones in most games. Like, I always like the idea of having a swarm of drones that do my work for me. First thing you become aware of on waking is the disconnect. The delay between thinking and feeling. Between, like, wanting to act and acting. Minor. It's almost imperceptible, but it's always present. It's at its worst when you wake up, when yourself has spent many dark hours recalling what it felt like to be real, to be a person, to be in a body that was indisputably yours. A leap into a cold lake on a hot day and the sting of blood welling from a fresh wound, the friction of a fingertip. All of a sudden the memories are closer than you thought, blurring as you approach, and so you can't tell one from the other. The cold slips in behind and around you and sensations fade out of reach. Perhaps you should be thankful for the dulled nature of this new body, given your current circumstances. The walls of the container feel immediately present. Cold, hard at your back and face and cramping up your limbs. You resist the desire to stretch, knowing that the claustrophobia comes next, and retreat a little from the central nervous system. It isn't painful. Not like you used to know pain, at least. In emergency mode, pain is a message delivered with efficiency and ease, a reminder that harm is imminent. There's no insistent throb, no trembling nerves, just a warning delivered with the banal quality of a digital notification. Right now, there are thousands of them. You mostly remember that it wasn't a good plan, but then your options were limited. And once you got the itch to get out by any means possible, it was either that plan or something much worse. It was at least simple. Collapse the shaft, drift away into chaos, slip into cargo processing, seal yourself in a container, and then just hope that the freighter left before you were missed. Some were lost in the shaft. Others never found the meeting point. Only a few made it to the containers. But the freighter, as far as you know, left. That feels like enough. Enough to know that you might no longer be on a grim and heartless rock. Even in the airless hold of a freighter, you might freeze solid long before you reach a destination. 
But you're restless. It's been a long time since you left. Weeks? Months? You're dully aware of damage to your legs and your right arm. You've been reserving energy as much as possible, but even then your body has shut many of its systems down to protect you. You spent much of that time asleep knowing that anything else would be impossible to endure. You feel the weight of impossibility begin to gather. It's time to sleep again. To nudge this false body into inducing delta waves in your emulated mind. And once again, recoil into a dream when you were once a person. Time passes. The cold creeps in. You feel something? Warmth? Not true warmth, but the indication of its presence. Your joints release from their rigor. Sound too, everywhere, screeching and shimmering so loud that your body ducks your hearing to protect its sensors. Then light. White as the cold. Then softer. Softer. Until a haze of dirty yellow a figure appears. You're out. Oh, cool. Can we, like, rotate this right here? Aw, dude. Okay, so we can. We can use, actually, the scroll wheel right here to take a look. And it looks like this is just the ring of a station. So this is a gravity ring. Like, this is basically, like, the theorized way to simulate gravity in space. And so we've got a ring that's orbiting around a central strut. You can actually see the connector right there that takes it up to the central, like, hub station. And we can rotate around that ring. Cool. It's been a few hours since Dragos pulled you from the container. You sit huddled in a corner of his scrapyard, swaddled in the reflective folds of a mylar blanket. You're coming back to consciousness and back to life, and you stare at the ornately curving element of an improvised heater. You're surrounded by angular, incoherent lumps of ships, some corroded beyond recognition, others still carrying glassy wounds along their edges where a plasma arc sliced them apart. As you trace the shape with fogged eyes, you hear a voice. Oh, sleeper, you all thawed yet? Almost. Never seen one of you come in like this. New frames must have had better perseverance than Sub-Zero Vac. Seen more than a few of you frozen solid to hull plates or inside outer locks in my time. Weren't always so lucky. Dragos comes into focus, shrouded in makeshift tech, his headset with its glinting eyes the mark of a drone operator. On his shoulder, one of his symbiotically linked drones perches, its irising eye locking you with an unflinching stare. Last living sleeper that came through this yard was a while ago. Didn't last long. You struggle to read his expression beneath the tech, but he seems lost in memory for a moment. Or perhaps he's just figuring out what to do with you. I plan to survive. You aren't sure if he hears you. I ain't gonna ask what led you to it. Sell yourself to a corporation, I suppose you know you can't go back. Old body, that's theirs now, and you're just, uh, software. Rogue emulation, legally possessing corporate property. You nod along. You remember biometrically signing the forms, the cold floor on your feet as you padded into the sleeper cells. The promise of a life off-world, but as you do, you get the now familiar sensation that these aren't your memories. These are things that you know, but they aren't things that you feel. You're no longer that person. You're an offshoot. A copy. What you won't know is what's ahead. At least the last one didn't. There's no easy way to put it. That body of yours is falling apart. Same for any sleeper who makes it out. S and Art wants to protect their property, but uh, if they can't keep a hold of you, well, no one can. You remember that too, at least the rumors of it from the other sleepers. Planned obsolescence. A built-in dependence on the regularly administered supplements that were part of your routine. Stop taking them and your body starts shutting down. Separates you from your emulated mind. How long has it been? How long do you have? But for now, sleeper, you're one of the lucky ones. Dragos glances up and away towards the glassy dome of the yard. The eye is the best place you could possibly be right now. The eye? The station. You'll see soon enough. Dragos impatiently drags his weight. Look, I got things I need to be getting on with, he trails off. There's an old freight container I've been using to storage out in the stacks. We haven't been pulling in much valuable scrap these days, so you're welcome to it. Something wells up inside of you. Emotion. Fatigue. You shakily get up to your feet and nod. All right, well, you head on up there. You look like you could use some rest. With that, Drago stalks back into the wrecks, his drones already converging on a rusting hulk. Plasma flashes silhouette his spindly figure as he returns to work. 
So welcome to Erlen's Eye. Life on the Eye runs in cycles, during which you can talk to characters, explore areas of the station, and perform actions. At the end of every cycle, you need to head to your current home to rest. Resting will move time forward, so head to the empty container and rest. Alright, sounds good. You wait curled up in the corner of the container and begin slowly assembling the world around you. After all this time, you still find this body, the one that you're waking up in right now, strange and disjointed. Its messages are readable, but somehow wrong. You sit up, pulling the mylar blanket close against the cold. Here you are in a ruined station, millions of miles from everyone you know. Are you still in system? Did any of the others make it out? It's impossible to know. After all this, what else matters? Building a life. Maybe you did get lucky, finding yourself here, and maybe here on the edge of everything there's a life for you to build. But before you can build anything, you need to learn to survive out here. Maybe if you can do that, you can assemble that life. Dragos has a few comforts in the container. The mylar blanket, the bedroll you slept on, a canister of water, a makeshift electric stove, and some faded sachets of desiccated powder. You rub the power stud of the stove and begin to boil the water. The contents of the sachets smell like damp wood, and you sprinkle them into the liquid. As the pungent smell washes over you, images of your restless sleep come back to you. A ring, like the station, but skeletal and ghostly. A web of threads pulling at your skin. A constellation of bright polygonal shapes. Angular suns burning into your mind. There's something unpleasantly visceral about the images, and it's long after you finish drinking that they start to fade. You tidy away the stove as best you can and try to gather enough energy to greet the day. Alright. So a brief explanation of what we've got going on inside of the UI here. I went ahead and briefly ran through all this. So this is effectively our health bar. It determines like how close we are to death. Uh, basically because we are a emulated construct put inside of a robotic body. We need those corporate pharmaceuticals to stay alive, but we don't have access to them now that we're abandoned on the space station. And so this is going to naturally degrade with time because we're not able to take our drugs. However, there will be other ways to keep it up. Uh, it determines how many dice we get, so apparently these dice right here determine whether or not we succeed or fail at various actions we're going to be doing on the space station while maintaining it and getting our bearings. And then this down here is our energy bar. And so anyways, this is basically our food meter. That's all that you really need to know. And if it gets down too low, apparently our health bar goes down twice as fast because we can't hold off the symptoms of withdrawal. Alright, well, what do we have going on here? Dragos has stood in the corner when you close up the container. He's still wearing his headset, and in the harsh light of the corridor, you realize it's an implant. Drones on his shoulder, its cache of sensor eyes rapidly irising. How you feeling? Not great. The drone chirps and Dragos nods. You notice that beneath the operator's rig, his skin is marked by burns and blotches. Yeah, I know the container ain't much, but it'll keep you safe. He pauses, so I'm not going to chit-chat too long. You well enough to work today? Sure. All right, then, he nods. At the yard, it's simple stuff. We hack these old holes down, and then we sell them off to shipyards and the bright market dealers for cryo. Occasionally, we'll pull out some tech, something with a bit more value, but most of what comes in is going to be scrap. It's hard to find good hands here, but I figure as a sleeper, you're going to be used to the manual labor. Obviously, I'll slip you a few chits of commission based on what you turn up. These right here. He pulls out a handful of small metal bars. Airwall cryo isolated from the market. It's what we use for trading out here. He stuffs them into a pocket. He shuffles his feet nervously. Look, I wouldn't normally do this, but in my opinion, you'd be best suited to moving on about as quick as you can, and sleepers, well, he trails off. Well, things being the way they are for me at the yard, I could use the help. I'm happy to help. Okay. He pauses, thinking of something else to add. Look, just come on down to the yard when you're feeling a bit fresher. I think there's plenty to do. Will do. He nods distractedly and turns and walks away, the drone hopping along ahead of him. I'll see you later, he calls back. Looks like it's time to get to work. Okay, let's go check it out. Uh, so if we rotate around, there's our house right there, and it really looks... Oh, we've got something over here. So there's a low-end gate. Okay, so we definitely want to look around. I can take a look at my character sheet over here. I don't know how limited I am, though. But then again, because I'm afflicted with crippling inability to focus on any task that a game gives me, I want to know what this does. 
After some spacers caused trouble in the low end, Yadagon have imposed a toll for entry. At least that's what they say. Oh, we need 60 cryo to get in. Okay. Fair enough. Well, then we'll head on off to work. Okay, so we've got various dice, and these are going to spawn in based on our condition. Uh, so it gives you a little dice reader over here just to let you know. Hopefully that once we get to, like, slotting those in, it will also have a pop-up that kind of, like, reminds you because I'm bad with my memory. But anyways, if we have this little circle right here, our dice will give us a 100% chance of succeeding. This one right here gives us a 50-50 positive neutral. These ones right here give us, like, a 25 positive, 50 neutral, 25% negative. And this one right here is, like, 50-50. So fair enough. Okay, so now that we're down at the yard, we can go ahead and take a look and see what we can pull off. Uh, we do have a couple of the 100% successes right here. I don't know what effect the minus one is going to have, so like, let's say that we do the salvage manually. I mean, we do have engineering, so we've got a 100% positive result right here, so like, we might as well go for it. And it looks like as we perform these actions, it's going to be filling in a track, basically. And so if we have positive outcomes, uh, something good is going to happen. And it looks like this is going to be for the next narrative prompt. And I sort of, like, dig this narrative delivery. In a way, in a roundabout way, it sort of reminds me of Hades, uh, looking at it, if that's indeed how it works. So maybe I'll wait until I comment on that until we find out. Okay. So, actions often progress clocks. They're displayed below. And so, once you complete these right here, something happens, I guess. Something good or bad. Yeah, so, that's what I was going to say, is it kind of reminds me of Hades, where, like, as you do various activities, and as you, like, interact with people, you unlock further narrative development. And I sort of like that. Uh, this right here, we don't really get negative results, so we might as well go for it. So even the rustiest hull can hide valuable components and materials. Extracting them means cutting carefully and skillfully. Okay, so in Citizen Sleeper, you will unlock drives as you discover more about yourself and the world. These drives guide you in pursuing specific objectives depending on which path you desire to take. You can track drives, and any track drive will place a yellow marker on locations that will help you pursue that goal. Okay. Hey, we got a neutral outcome right there. That's okay. I'll take that over a negative outcome. I don't really know. So this one right here has like a 50-50 positive or negative, and its label is risky. So basically a safe action, even if you fail it, it seems like there's no real outcome that's like bad. Uh, whereas if it has like a risky down here, the negative outcome is more than likely going to be a loss in your energy. And then if it's red down here, it means that the negative action is probably going to result in your health going down. Let's maybe just finalize this one right here. All right. So we're getting there. Like, we've almost filled up the Dragos track to see what's next with his storyline. We've earned ourselves some money. We've got, like, 45 cryo that's rattling around now. I don't know exactly where that's listed. But we can take a look at the UI. Uh, so over here, this is our character sheet. And it looks like we are going to be able to pick up perks over the course of the game, should we desire to do so. It looks like we started out with Transfer Intercept, so we have a chance to gain Cryo whenever we interface with any object. We don't really have anything flagged as, as interface just yet, but still, we have it. And it looks like down here our Cryo is listed right there. Okay, so we found that in the UI. And then it looks like we're going to be picking up data items at some point as well. Uh, let's see here. Havenage Construction Yards? Okay, we've got Dock C4, the Rotunda Wet Dock. It looks like over here we have the Rotunda Dock Terminal. We've got Dock B2. What is the drive? We just, we're trying to find someone that'll help us live. Oh, that's exactly what it is. So we need corporate pharmaceuticals. Okay, so, so basically we're jonesing right now and we're trying to find somebody to be our dealer. Gotcha. Well, before we interact with anything else, what I'd like to do... So I'm going to rest to get my dice back. Because, like, I don't know if some of these interactions are going to force me to make a dice roll. And I'd like to have something kind of, like, in my back pocket so that I can fix that. This time you don't really wake up. Instead, the ghost of the station, that shifting skeletal ring, is surrounding you. For a moment, you're gone and absent from your own body, stretched out across a colorless void. 
Then the connections begin to establish themselves, threads tugging on the edge of your mind. These threads become vectors of exchange and then extensions. As you feel your thoughts slipping away down them, dissolving into the millions of distributed nodes they connect into, you see the station. No, you feel the station. Like a web of texture in a smooth black liquid. You find a point, and you connect to it, pulse through it, and follow the loops and paths that are around it. You touch more points than you have fingers, and then you try in a moment of impulsiveness to connect them. The flow passes through you so rapidly that you feel yourself being carried with it, splitting and separating, eddying and gathering. As you do things occur to you, things that you can't possibly know, you reach out and try to grasp them and try to touch them as well. You notice a tugging feeling pulling at you insistently as if it were a small child. Somehow it's pulling in two directions at once and you look down. All of a sudden it turns off. You come back trembling into an unfamiliar body, both yours and not yours, all at once. You find yourself standing in the container, eyes now open to the dark steel walls, and you feel a change within you. A shift. You close your eyes for a second and you feel it waiting there, the station splayed out across your mind. A storm of connective nodes waiting to be explored and then it's gone. Okay. So we're down to dice right now and we don't really have any positive interactions. I'm gonna suggest that maybe we find a place where we can buy food. So there's a shipyard over here. There's a dock over there. There's a market. Let's go to the market and try this out. So we can explore the market or we can ask for directions from the locals. This one is dangerous though. However, it looks like we're just expanding our knowledge over there, not necessarily actually like buying anything. At the dock over here, it looks like we can do... Oh, we can't do anything. Apparently, this is just the storyline advancing all by its own. Okay, so something's going to happen at the dock in four turns, and something's going to happen over here at Hellion Crossing are going to be here in what looks like eight turns, seven turns. Okay. I would like a synopsis, actually, so it'd be cool to have an unfolding menu that you can click on where it folds open and it has all these icons right here listed, and it has a timer, like a track, so that you can see them all in one place, and then with like a summary number of cycles next to it so that you can kind of like appropriately plot and plan in your head. That'd be nice. Let's mess around in the market, I guess. So that right there, we have a 25% chance of something negative happening. We'll give it a go. Now we got a positive outcome, so we gained local knowledge. Very nice. This right here has a chance of a negative outcome. We don't really have any energy left. I'd suggest we mess around with the neutral outcome instead. Okay. Apparently we figured it out. We found a slum doctor over here, and we found the Ort Exchange, and we found the Emphis st uh, Street Food Vendor. Nice. We need food. Let's go buy some food. Emphis is busy, his broad face up lit by the makeshift gas burner in front of him. With precise, delicate movements, he lays thick chunks of marinated fungus into a dented wok, his other hand idly tossing a metal bowl of sliced vegetables and some red fleck dressing. The smell is incredible. You watch as he fulfills a set of orders, heaping the fungus with a bright salad and depositing it in plastic trays. A sack of chits rattles in his apron pocket as customers file past the burner, handing over payment. You join the queue, and it's mostly made of off-duty salvagers, vac suits unzipped and rolled down to expose stained vests, grubby mods, a lattice of scars and tattoos. They discuss the best food on the eye, the best drink, comparing notes on bright market dives. Their words cut through with heavy spacer slang. Eventually, it's your turn, and you shuffle up to the front. Emphis speaks in a deep, even tone without looking up. First try's free. Thank you. The smell is unbearably strong as he cooks. The earthiness of the fungus, laced with something so spicy the smoke makes your eyes water. The heat from the burner is like a bonfire, and your skin hardens in its glare. I know you. You sleepers. Emphis says while he cooks, his voice deep but clear. Hard life. A lot of stories. He glances up from beneath his cap with piercing eyes. I'd know. You tell him one of your stories. You tell him about your journey to the eye, and he nods as he cooks, his eyes never leaving his work. You tell him of the confusion and the pain, but the sense of possibility and its sudden arrival. You tell him of the cold and the dark of the container and the endless cycles spent inside of it. 
Now it seems you tell him like some dream that you once had but can't quite seem to forget. You tell him that the eye excites you and scares you and you're unsure of where to walk and where to look, what to do. Eventually you tail trail off, running out of words. He places a plastic tray of steaming fungus in your hand. Next time we'll talk some more. He smiles. But next time you gotta pay. He slams a heavy hand against a button on the burner's side and it turns off. The roar of the flame and its impressive heat fades. Next time, sleeper. He waves you away and begins to oil the walk, and before you turn back to the alley, you notice the geometric patterns of a circular scar across his forearm, each surrounded with a constellation of glinting pin marks. You walk away, and as you do, you take a bite of the rich, spicy, delicate, sweet fungus. Your tasting sensors light up like a fusion reactor. Yeah, you'll come back. Oh, thank God, dude. All right, so we've got a new drive. Uh, so our new drive is to get to know Emphis. And then also, we can build a ship mine? What the hell is a ship mine? Uh, you've heard talk of a fabricator that's owned by the Ord Exchange, and then a few fragments you could build a ship mined core. I don't know what that is, but it sounds awesome. Let's go to the doctor, though, first, because, like, we got a freebie dinner, and so I I'd like to work on my fading ex It says fading on my health bar, dude. I, I feel like I'm slowly slipping out of existence, and honestly, the kind of that panic survival feeling is starting to take over. So let's get our meters taken care of, and once we've actually figured out, like, how to sustain all of our various meters, then we can actually crack into the actual, you know, narrative stuff. But honestly, I really like the presentation of the game, and the narrative prose is really, really good. Like, the word selection is delicate and careful, and yet it's, like, forceful when it needs to be. Whoever wrote on this game did a good job, because honestly, what it reminds me of is the writing in Disco Elysium, and that's very, very high praise considering that in the world of indie games, Disco Elysium has almost peerless writing, so even to be considered in the same conversation is honestly, like, just to have that be the first thing that pops to mind when I'm reading the various lines and the characterization and whatnot, uh, that's a very, very good sign right there. Next comes the call from the enforcer at the door. You shuffle down the flickering hallway towards the open market door and keep your head down, shoulders high in queue, trying not to bring attention to yourself. You were thankful for the tip-off that a doctor was operating out of this place, and now you're here, you aren't so sure. There's a gang enforcer on the door, the flickering light strips, the decaying hab block. They've all made the long queue a test of your nerve, but your options are few, and without a supply of stabilizer, your body is, well... You suppress a shiver and shuffle forward to the line. You try to find something to distract yourself. You lean against the doorframe and look into the apartment. The entryway is dark and punctuated by the green indicators of stacks of sealed containers. You lean in and see amber light filtering through a far doorway, screened with plastic sheeting beyond which blurred shapes move. The slap of the enforcer's palm against the doorway jerks you awake. Wait your turn, he growls. A few moments later, a figure pushes through the doorway and you catch a distant voice. Send the next one in, Toshiro. The enforcer jerks his head and you slip inside, passing through the dark entryway and pushing through a plastic sheet to the far door. The far room beyond is bathed in warm light and a floor-to-ceiling transparent panel gives a full view of the bright market sealed roof and the buzzing traffic above and for a moment you're transfixed by the motion. Sit, says a sharp voice, and you see a silhouetted figure turned away replacing the plastic sheeting over the frame of a simple folding bed. You make your way across the room. The figure turns, and as they do, you see an expression of confusion flash across their features. They open their mouth as if to speak and blink, and then quickly regain their composure. Please, sit. They gesture to the bed and then turn to an open case of tools on the table. You sit. Sabine turns. A compact diagnostic scanner of some type in their hand. They hold it to their eye. Remain still, please. Their tone is clipped and businesslike. You stare ahead, still dazed from their expression when you entered. Fear, recognition, sadness, unmistakably etched across their face. How long have you been on station? They ask, the scanner still in their eye. A few cycles. It's good you came to me. They set the diagnostic scanner on the table. I'm going to start by assuming you don't know anything, so they take your arm and roll up your sleeve, inspecting your synthetic skin. Your body's dying. They say it without ceremony and without drama, but not without empathy. SNARP doesn't like to see its proprietary technology set loose, and so to prevent bodies like yours, frames they call them, from being stolen, repurposed, or in your case, escaping, they built a process of so-called planned obsolescence. Frames decay rapidly when they're not regularly injected with a stabilizer, one which SNARP remains the sole producer of. They look up. That sound kind of familiar? Yep. Good. That's gonna help. 
Uh, they swap down to your other arm, running some thin metal device over your skin, and you feel your forearm tremble. Sorry, Sabine says. You're unsure if they mean for the cold touch of the metal or everything else. Emulations like you, like sleepers, as most people know you, you aren't classified as people in any of the surrogate systems, so you have no rights and no status. They focus hard on the inspection of your arm. S and ARP has no reason to release Stabilizer into the market. Sabine looks up as if to apologize again, but they stop themselves. Look, I, I know little of this is going to be of use to you, and they turn away, disassembling the metal instrument and cleaning it. Silence fills the room as Sabine works, and then silence gives way to tension. You stare at their back, willing them to say something, anything. Sabine turns to face you. I think I can help. They sigh, and you see the darkness under their eyes and hear the fatigue in their voice, and they gesture to the door. You saw Toshido outside? He works for a benefactor? Yadagon. They're influential in the low end. They give me this space to work with. They run the door and take up the profits. At the same time, I gotta fix up their enforcers, tend to implants, sew up wounds. But Yadagon has connections, smugglers from the Starward Belt, and mercenaries working for the corporations on Ember. If they can source the stabilizer, you have a chance. Sabine sets down a slate, their notes complete. This is dangerous, and it's gonna get expensive, but I think we can pull it off. Why help me? Sabine walks away to the window, their face dappled by the shadows of passing drones. Let's just see if this works first. I'll let you know when I have a lead. You nod and leave. Sabine is still staring out and unmoving, and when you reach the lower level of the market, you look back up through the panels of the roof to see if you can find their face, but the room is dark against the lights of the market. You duck your head and walk off into the crowd. Okay, well, I mean, we, we did something. I mean, we gave it a go. We don't really have a whole lot of dice to fiddle around with. We could go back to the yard. I do think that, like, so when this menu is open right here and we click on one of these, this should auto-fold back in. Uh, you should never have one menu overlapping another UI interface menu, basically. Like, you want everything to be clear and cut in its own space when it comes to the gestalt design. It's kind of like a minor foible, but ultimately, when you zoom in on a location, this should auto-fold back in so that you can automatically see all the interactive windows that you can click on without this getting in the way. Uh, by all means, allow players to open it so that it overlaps on their own. That way, they can check, check their object objectives and whatnot. But in general, when these all come to the forefront, you want them to be the focus, and then this can be an optional thing that kind of the player can pop out on their own. We could do a whole dissection. We do have manual salvage over here, but I don't think we're good at it. The negative outcome is going to sap some of our energy, and we don't exactly know what food's going to cost. But YOLO, man. Throw it. Hey, we got a neutral outcome, so we came out with a little bit more money, and we advanced the track with Dragos. Uh, I think we're pretty much out of things to do. We could explore the Rotunda, but I don't know if that's going to take dice. It is indeed going to take dice. And so we can get to know the Rotunda. Apparently, we could steal dock plans. Or we can explore the rotunda on our own and just learn what's here. So that's probably going to unfold more or less the exact same way that the market unfolded after we complete its track. But I do think that that's a really, really elegant, delicate way to exemplify player narrative progress without them kind of like... So like what some games do is that like they expect you to interact with them, but you don't know exactly when the next thing is going to happen, which can then make the game feel repetitive because you're constantly redoing actions, trying to get a result to pop. I like that in this game they give you a concrete track that is like, when you do this... This will happen after this many interactions. It makes it feel less mundane. Like, it, it forestalls boredom because you know exactly how far you have to travel down the road before you hit a rest stop. Let's try out the exchange. Let's see what the exchange has got going on. Uh, so I do need dice to be in the exchange. I can sell things as well, and so I'm assuming occasionally we'll get, like, a critically successful option. Uh, when we're doing the scrap breakdown. And that'll give us the components we need to sell over here. And then it looks like over here we can actually play the market, like buy low, sell high, in order to make money that way too. Does it have a track that advances? So we've got to survive for what looks like three turns. 
So we're going to be rolling on three dice for pretty, for a while. Like, I don't think there's just any way around that until they, they source a smuggler to get us the stabilizer. Okay. Well, since we don't have any dice, I guess we'll just uh, head to the end of the cycle. Again, the skeletal ring of the station fills your mind. It sparks with glittering lights like stars reflected in a winter lake. It's clearer and crisper than before, and the threads are still pulling, but you're in place, flickering in the flow. Between the threads, you see bright shapes, caches of shimmering light beneath transparent crystal forms. You follow the path of a thread across the ring, though these forms then leaping off into the void. You begin to understand. These are nodes and connections, a map of information, of communication. Seems to be an almost impossible to parse, but you start to try. Focus on the nodes themselves. They're glassy and bright, but in all this flow, there's only solid and fixed points. You approach a pyramid and lean close to it. Inside, shifting layers conceal a tangle of threads, a meeting point of exchange. But before you can gleam in, or before you can glimpse inside, the glass clouds and hardens, cutting you off. The threads and nodes, passages and puzzle boxes, one leads to another, and there's so much here. So many answers and so many questions. All you need to do is follow the paths and open the boxes, and you look out across this ghost landscape of exchange and see an opportunity. And then you're insistent on tugging again, pulling at you. You look down again and see two lines pulling in different directions as if they're tied around you. The first? The first thread leads out away from the station into the inky black. Somebody out there is tracking you and hunting you and following the thread. They're in a ship and the ship is approaching with every cycle. The second thread leads in, pulling deep to the station, and your gaze follows it and you see something. A sphere shimmering above a strange, angular body. A pulse shoots out from it, passing over you like a torch beam. Testing you. Tasting you. You open your eyes. Time is short. Hey, we got some good success die, though. So that's nice. Everything here does not suck. And it looks like we can now access the cloud of the eye. It's a network of decaying protocols and data caches. While there, you can use dice and items to access systems and extract data. These old networks are ancient and strange. Click the I button at the top of the screen to turn it on and off. Okay. Oh. Oh, you have to match the inputs here. But this is what we're good at. This is the job that we're good at right here, which is basically kind of writing throughout the future internet. And so we don't have the right dice for right now, but it might not be the worst idea just to kind of like catalog what dice we need for various things. I need a Havenage Cypher to get in there. I need a one to get in there. I need a Cypher over there. Okay. Three. Okay, so it looks like it's mostly low rolls. Oh, I have a three, actually. I can get into this one. Yeah, there we go. Do I want to do that, though? I do have a lot of... Let me see how much food costs first, actually, because we need to eat food, obviously. So we'll go back and eat some food. It's 15 cryo for some food. So yeah, it ain't cheap. But we are advancing a track right now with becoming friends with uh, Emphis as well. I really like the presentation of this game. I like the structure of it. I like the design of it. It's basically Tharsis, but they've taken that core mechanic from Tharsis. Like, so the mechanic in Tharsis with the die that you rolled every single turn was basically used to beat you about the head because it's a roguelike and it's supposed to be hard and it's supposed to be punishing. In this game, the dice are meant to kind of like help you fail forward in a Disco Elysium style way and kind of like, I don't know if there is a fail state where you actually die, but ultimately it seems like they've reappropriated the, the mechanic from Tharsis in order to create a narrative RPG and I really, really like that. But anyways, my name is Splattercat. We're out of time for the day. This is Citizen Sleeper. I may... I don't get a lot of free time, but I may dive into this one in my free time. I, I like what they're going after right here.
First impressions are honestly positive for me so far. It's actually kind of weird that this game isn't popping up on further radars like on other mediums and whatnot. Now, starting with the visual style of the game, I find it to be just exactly the right amount of bleak versus vibrant. Uh, the art has kind of a Otomo vibe that I think works really, really well for the game. And it's just got the tiniest bit, so it's like a big helping of Akira mixed with like the tiniest bit of just gritty MTV early 90s Aeon Flux sludge mixed in there. And I think it really makes the whole thing pop in both kind of a colorful, but also sort of grim way. Like all of the characters just have these morose looks on their faces. And like you can tell that it's a hard life out here. Whereas normally cartoons tend to kind of soften that blow, I think they captured it just right where these are cartoon characters and they are bright and they are colorful, but that bright and colorful nature of their art design also doesn't transfer into the personalities. Like these are people that are living hard lives out here on the ring. Um, I like the design of the systems, and yes, this is an RPG with skills and stats and whatnot, but I think it's largely a game about exploration, discovery, and really just show, don't tell. A game where you're coming to grips with effectively being abandoned corporate property on this space station. It doesn't feel like this is going to be a game that's going to be exceedingly difficult or like open to being min-maxed. Instead, it kind of feels like a game where you read through every dialogue and you sip a cup of coffee on like a rainy afternoon. It's a somber, quiet sort of RPG that I think has more in common with games like Coffee Talk or Valhalla uh, rather than like something like Baldur's Gate. It's got its own edge and it's cutting in its own direction and I'm excited about that. I actually actively want to spend more time with this game during this like 45 minutes that we've spent or 35 or whatever the time track is on. This game kind of bit me. Uh, thus far there's no bugs, no major issues. The soundtrack is nice and I think it set the tone nicely and so I think I'll leave it right here. My name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to. Today we had Citizen Sleeper Tomorrow we will have something else. Thank you for hanging out with me, and I'll catch you all next time.